Welcome everyone to our latest Critical Conversation, our series of online fireside chats about topical issues for engineering and for society. My name is Hayatun Salim and I'm the Chief Executive of the Royal Academy of Engineering and the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering Foundation. Here at the Royal Academy of Engineering, our overarching goal is to harness the power of engineering to build a sustainable society and an inclusive economy that works for everyone. And these critical conversations look at some of the challenges that we're going to need to address on our way to achieving this goal. Today's discussion focuses on the legal, ethical, safety and sustainability challenges associated with data immortality. This conversation is also informed by the work of our Engineering X Safer End of Engineered Life mission. And for those of you that don't know it, Engineering X is an international collaboration founded by the Academy and the Lloyds Register Foundation, which is bringing together global experts to engineer change. And we have two fantastic experts here today who are going to help us to navigate this topic, Professor Anna Vasiri and Dr. Natasha McCarthy. And I'm going to introduce them both very shortly. Recent advances in big data, data-driven engineering have brought huge benefits to our society, keeping us connected, enabling new services, new capabilities, and enriching our lives in a myriad of ways. But one thing that we've learned from our Engineering X Safer End of Engineered Life mission is that you have to think about the end at the beginning if you want to achieve a responsible, sustainable, and safe approach to the decommissioning and disposal of engineered products. And since data, unlike most engineered products, does not inherently have a finite lifespan, it's perhaps all the more important for us to be intentional and thoughtful about what end of life means for data. And it's increasingly urgent that we get to grips with this because it's a problem that is only growing more acute. 90% of the data that exists today online has been generated since 2016. According to IBM, by 2020, there was 300 times more information in the world than there was in 2005. And in the era of the Internet of Things, the volume and the speed of data collection and processing has the potential to increase exponentially. And there's also a clear sustainability imperative to tackling end of life for data. I think instinctively, we all perceive that there are environmental benefits that can come from digital and data-driven technologies. Perhaps the most widely used example so prevalent in our lives today is the ability for online meetings to reduce the carbon footprint associated with traveling to in-person meetings. But understanding true sustainability impact is not a trivial process and digital does not always equal greener. Data storage and maintenance are energy intensive. And it's been calculated by people who know a lot more about this than I do, that if the internet was a country, it would be the fifth biggest energy consumer in the world. And embedded in this massive carbon footprint is our society's unspoken assumption that our data will be available for us indefinitely. It turns out that our photos, videos, preferences can live forever in the cloud, but they can't live there rent free. And I'm guessing that not many of us have really considered the ethical and the legal jeopardy that can result when our online data outlives us. So in today's critical conversation, we're going to try and grip, get to grips with all of this and look at what the engineering community can do to address the safety and sustainability challenges relating to end of life for data. And we're also going to discuss how engineers can work more effectively with other sectors, with policymakers, with businesses, civil society, lawmakers to bring about change. So. Let me now introduce our guests and get this conversation going. Professor Anna Vasiri is a professor in geospatial data science and a UKRI Future Leaders Fellow at the University of Glasgow. Anna works on developing solutions that consider missingness and biases as useful sources of data with partners ranging from Google to Ordnance Survey, Uber and the Alan Turing Institute. We're delighted that Anna was appointed as an Engineering X Safer End of Engineered Life champion and forms part of our global network of individuals across 11 different countries working in a range of industries, sectors and disciplines who are all leading projects to improve safety in the way we dismantle and dispose of engineered products and structures. And secondly, I'm delighted to introduce my colleague, Dr. Natasha McCarthy, who works here at the Royal Academy of Engineering as Associate Director for the National Engineering Policy Centre, which connects policymakers with critical engineering expertise to inform and respond to policy issues of national and global importance. Prior to this, Natasha was Head of Policy at the Royal Society, where she led the Society's work on data and digital technology, covering issues such as the governance of AI and data use and enabling well-governed access to data. 
She was previously head of policy at the British Academy and also director of education and subsequently honorary lecturer at UCL's department, science, technology, engineering and public policy. Natasha is the author of Engineering, a Beginner's Guide, a must read, a tour of the social, cultural and historical impacts of engineering and co-editor of Philosophy and Engineering, Reflections on Practice, Principles and Process, lovely alliteration. And she's also authored several papers spanning engineering, technology, policy and philosophy. So great speakers to help us to tackle this really important topic. Anna and Natasha, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm going to get us going with a few questions of my own, and then we're going to open up to questions from the audience. So while we're kicking things off, audience, please feel free to drop questions into the chat box, and I will try to get through as many of them as possible during the conversation. So, Anna, to get us started, perhaps you could give us an overview of the current situation in terms of end of life and data, especially in the era of the Internet of Things. What are the key challenges that we need to be aware of? That's a very important question. I think digital data are unique in a couple of ways, in many ways, but specifically in two ways. One is what I would like to call that as immortality of digital data. Basically, anything that we know, either we design them or it's just natural, they have a finite finite lifetime. It's either by design or natural or functional obsolescence. But digital data, technically speaking, can live forever. You know, we can mirror databases, we can back it up, we can store it forever. And that brings us a huge amount of challenge because basically whatever we have had so far as a regulation or safety features or um, other aspect of uh, design are designed for something that can live for a finite period of time. Uh, for example, we have um, so many regulations like GDPR that protect our personal um, data, but they apply to only alive people. When we die, they're not going to be applicable in an um, automatic way. Also, the other feature that is related to the digital data, that is about invisibility of digital data. We don't see it, although it is very physical. There are data centers and you know servers, but we don't see it. That means we do that uh, sort of digital lifestyle activity way more than physical activity. For example, of course, yes, sending an email is less um, environmentally damaging than sending a paper in terms of the carbon footprint. But how many emails we send in comparison with the number of letters that we send? So this brings a lot of environmental aspect and challenges that is because data can actually outlive the lifetime that we usually design for it or um, um, it, technically speaking can be overused in that sense. So there are a lot of um, environmental issues legal aspect, emotional challenges, because, you know, so, some of our accounts live outside the lifetime of the account holder. And if they are being hacked, for example, um, we can't really act on that very easily uh, because of the rules and regulation applies to um, usually alive people. So these two aspects of environmental and legal challenge are going to be a massive issue in future. Thank you, Anna. Well, that's that's a really good um, high level framing. We're going to drill down into more detail in, um, in the course of the discussion. But first of all, I'd just like you to talk a bit about your role as um, an Engineering X Safer End of Engineered Life champion. You're part of our first co cohort. Can you tell us what you're aiming to achieve in this role? Well, SEAL champion program, um, the Safer End of Engineered Life, um, started based on looking at whatever we design as an engineer um, should have a lifetime and end of it should be designed through. When I saw the call, I realized as a data scientist, we, we don't really look at data as a thing that we design. And so we don't really think about data retention plan in a kind of good way that we should actually consider. Um, so I thought um, there are plenty of challenges associated with that that I described. And we need to raise awareness. This platform of being a champion of Ro uh, Royal Academy of Engineering, Engineering X um, as a part of SEAL champion would give me the platform to talk about the issues associated with that. So we can talk about our digital um, lifestyle carbon footprint, for example, as an environmental aspect of this or um, the, the problem with digital inheritance or um, other aspects of legal issues. 
Um, and, and we can raise awareness among public, but also industries are struggling in, in the other way because, you know, they're dealing with a lot of, um, you know, use, um, users problem and they want to have some sort of policy regulation implemented. And this could give us a, a way to make all the solution in a kind of consistent way. But of course, there are some policy that needs to be changed. I'm sure Natasha would talk about them uh, in more detail, but these require a bit of better awareness. So I, as the SEAL champion, will talk about uh, these sort of challenges. So public first realize that, oh, not everything that I do digitally is going to be as green as I had thought. So every click that I do, um, every like that I um, put on Twitter or um, any other social media activity that I have, uh, have got a carbon footprint. And so I should be more aware of that. So I can go on a kind of digital uh, diet if uh, that's a lifestyle, if that makes sense. So people realize a little more about the, um, the cost to the environment and also about the issues uh, that are related to their um, digital version online, like social media and other activity that they have. Great. Thank you, Anna. Um, digital diets, we might need to revisit that. But actually, you, you've done a great job of showing how the, the immortality and invisibility of data pose some quite specific challenges when we think about end of life. Natasha, Anna set out those are some of the challenges. Can you talk a bit about the policy response to these challenges, both in terms of what's been done so far, but also in terms of what more you think can and should be done? Thanks, Natasha. Brilliant. Thanks so much. Thank you, Hayat. It's great to join this conversation. And Anna's set up the issues really beautifully there. So highlighting, you know, what's unusual about data? What makes it different to different systems that we might regulate for safety and security and what creates challenges? Um, and so what I'll do in these sort of first comments is talk about some approaches to policy for data and data use, which highlight the fact that data creates kind of some unique challenges. So as mentioned in my bio, um, I used to lead the team at the Royal Society working on data and digital technology policy. And we work with the British Academy for Humanities and Social Sciences to think about new ways of governing data. What's, what's an appropriate governance framework for data, particularly because of the particular features of data that Anna set out, but also the, there's some really unique challenges around what data does when we start to use it. So some of the challenges around kind of processing data, some of the challenges around using data to get insights about people. So we did work to understand how we can enable use of data and get the benefits from data whilst ensuring we're protecting people's privacy, we're protecting people's rights and we're protecting security around data use. That work literally led to a piece of uh, a report called Data Management and Use. And that's quite an interesting point. It's a, a paper about data governance and ethics, but focused on data management as a solution, highlighted a set of principles around data management. So we talked about the need to protect individual and collective rights and interests when we manage data. We talked about the need to ensure that trade-offs around data management and data use are made transparently, countably, and inclusively. We talked about the need to seek out and learn from good practices and from success and failure and to enhance existing democratic governance. And all of those broad principles, I think are really good ways to think about how we build a good policy response to regulating data, which is as invisible, but as ubiquitous as Anna has just set out. Um, and so one of the things that really comes up through that work is that dealing with data and creating policy and legis legislative and regulatory regimes to deal with data involves navigating a set of tensions. And I think the thing that really stands out to me when you think about the end of life for data is data is an exceptionally valuable resource. It has economic value, it has personal value, it's an archive, it's a resource, it's a legacy. It's got interest to researchers from historians to engineers to social scientists and to medics. So how do we balance the need to protect the data and the people it relates to with enabling that use and also making sure that the data we are using is good quality, is accurate, and is not outlasting its designed or intended life. So the work that we did, I think, was very much thinking about the foundations of governance. And that kind of governance is now being brought to bear in lots of different ways. So we've had new bodies come up in, in UK government, such as the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation, which think about these issues and advise government on how to, how to tackle them bodies such as the Ada Lovelace Institute, which think about broad philosophical and social questions around data use. And I think there's lots of questions about uh, the end of it, data life, which are quite fundamental questions about data. 
Um, and we've seen government really tackle some of these questions. So, for example, uh, the UK government developed a national data strategy, which sought to look at how we can access the value in data and make use of data whilst making sure it's well managed and looked after. And we really appreciated in the national academies the focus on data responsibility in the national data strategy. And when the national academies, and that was the Royal Society, the British Academy, the Academy of Medical Sciences and the Royal Academy of Engineering helps feed into that national data strategy, we highlighted the importance of responsibility about data, not just using data in a responsible way, but making sure the data is maintained, that it's looked after, it's accurate, it's up to date. And we thought about that in terms of data as critical infrastructure, and critical infrastructure has to be invested in, maintained, and it has to be retired when it's beyond its safe purpose of use. So that's one area where government has really focused on the need to enable responsible attitudes to data. We're now seeing government uh, look at new forms of data protection legislation as we leave the EU. Uh, we expect some changes, but I'm expecting to see some of the kind of core principles that protect data protection to be maintained. So, for example, minimization, not collecting data that you don't need, not using it for purposes it's not intended for, ensuring there's a kind of limitation on how long you use data for. And I think that it's a real value if that legislation can clarify how to comply with that, whilst also enabling valuable data to be used by researchers and to be used as, as a legacy, as a source of insight, indeed sources of evidence in the future. So lots is happening in the policy world, but it's tackling a broad and complex problem. Natasha, that's really helpful, really clear explanation of some of the key policy developments that have taken place. Um, and what I'd just love to to get some further thoughts from you on is what are you seeing happening in terms of business response? What, what changes are you seeing there? What, what more do you want to see? I think there's a really clear sense uh, in the business community that data is a really important asset uh, to a company and that can mean lots of things. So one thing is obviously it has value, especially to tech companies, um, but that means that it also has sort of accountability and responsibility around it too. And what's really heartening is to see organisations that bring industry and business together really tackling the deep ethical questions about how businesses are responsible about data. Tech UK, the UK's uh, trade body for industry, has an annual data ethics summit, which is a fantastic way of talking about these kind of complex issues around data. But it's also interesting to see um, tech companies in particular uh, looking at the issue that Anna raised around the environmental footprint of data. Uh, the Royal Society would work around the impact of data on the environment and saw that there were pledges from tech companies to enable use, for example, of renewable energy to power data centres. And I think it's really important that those pledges are stuck to and that organisations that are using large amounts of data both tackle those ethical issues but hold the really good sort of stewarding position and make sure that they think about those environmental footprints as well as those wider ethical issues. Thank you, Natasha. And actually, I think I'm going to go straight from that into a slightly deeper look at the environmental dimension, because I think that's something that that is of a lot of interest. And, and actually, it's quite a confusing thing to try to understand if you don't have expertise. So we've all learned the, the basic lesson that it's more complex than it might look at first sight to understand the true environmental and sustainability impacts of any particular approach. Um, Anna, can you help us think a bit more about how we should be um, understanding the environmental impact of data and how we can strengthen our approach to end of life data to improve the sustainability of engineered products. Um, yeah, I can um, try. It's a, uh, as you said, very complex sort of ecosystem. So of course, digital version of anything, make it a little better. And, um, you know, thanks to the internet, we have been able to save a lot of carbon dioxide and any other greenhouse gas that we have had before. So it, it's not a bad thing, but it's not as green as we had thought. For example, 50% of all the ecosystem of um, information uh, and communication um, industry is because of data center where we actually keep data. And within that, 60% of the um the environmental emission are basically, or electricity that they require are because of video. For example, this conversation that you and I are having um, requires some streaming, there are some um, transactions and everything that we do requires to be stored or at least managed and processed in a data center. That requires some sort of cooling system 
And if the um, the energy that comes to do that cooling or um, other activity that is happening within the data center are not going to be uh, very um, efficient, um, they're going to be very, very damaging. So for example, just give um, a few numbers um, in the context. For example, data centers are responsible for almost one or two, depends on how you calculate that, uh, percent of all the electricity um, um, that we have um, globally. And that's if you translate that to the um, emission that we have from the whole airline industry, that's almost the same. So we talk about the uh, flight um, carbon emission and you know all the um, diet that should go to the flights, but we don't talk about the data. Um, the main reason that we have this huge amount of number um, um, that, that doesn't make sense even if we uh, look at it in that sense is because um, in a smaller scale, that's going to be relatively green. For example, I gave the example of uh, email that is going to be greener. Each email that we send is something between 0.3 gram of carbon dioxide to 50, depends on if you have any attachment to that email or you know how much text you put into that. But we send plenty of email. On average, you know, they say 20 email per day as um, an adult in the UK. Um, and that is definitely more than the number of letters that we would have sent if we didn't have internet. Um, if each of us um, in the UK sent just one fewer email per day, just one of those thank you, okay, I'll be there, that sort of email, just one fewer email, we are basically saving 16 tons of carbon dioxide annually. That, that's quite a number. So, so calculating that amount of um, emission based on little by little activity that we have is um, basically make us a bit aware of the, the kind of a thing that we do. Although there are a lot of activity related to making the, um, the whole net greener uh, initiative. Uh, for example, Google is um, about to become completely um, net zero. So they are using um, some of the um, type of resource of energy that they have. Some of them have got very creative. For example, just um, some years ago, Microsoft put some of their data center under the water at the coast of Scotland to just use sea temperature as a um, cooling system. And it has been very successful. And big companies are actually doing a lot, but um, as, the user, as citizen, we sometimes do not appreciate, you know, how much, um, you know, that sort of a streaming on Netflix or watching um, a live video or, you know, having a Zoom call would cost us. And there is always a flipping point. For example, um, yes, of course, having a Zoom call would be definitely better if I want to drive or have a flight and come to another city to have this meeting. Of course, it is better. But if we are um, relatively close by, we can actually have a meeting and it still would be greener than um, having the live stream on Zoom or any other platform that we use. So, so that sort of um, number should be uh, something that we calculate. And one of the things that I would like to do as part of this um, role that I have as a safe end of engineer at life for digital data champion is actually having that sort of um, list of activity and they associate carbon dioxide or any other greenhouse gas emission associated with all of that. So people actually realize that, okay, I should be careful when I um, actually post that photo. Should I send it on all my social media accounts or um, is it going to be, um, you know, just one in, is enough to just say I have a good day or, you know, that sort of um, nice pictures of breakfast that we have. Gosh, Anna, that's very thought provoking. Um... I'm going to ask Natasha if you want to add anything to this as well, because I know it's a topic you're interested in, you, you talked a little bit about it earlier, and then also ask Natasha whether you could um, share some thoughts on what you think the role is of engineers specifically in addressing these issues, and, and to what extent you think that engineers are actually equipped to respond effectively. Um, and just to remind the audience that please do uh, drop your questions into the chat, we'll be coming on to those very shortly, so Natasha, over to you, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Anna. That's brilliant. I love the way you set that out. And, and some really uh, sort of, you know, salutary statistics there about the, the carbon emissions from data. So, yes, when we were at the, when I was at the Royal Society, our team led some work on digital tech and the planet, looking at both the way in which we can use data and digital technology to achieve good environmental outcomes, but also looking at the environmental footprint of data. Uh, you know, and as mentioned by Anna, you know, it's really important to get a better picture 
of uh, the carbon emissions that come from the computing that we do, that the, the, our interactions in the digital world, but it is challenging to get those, deep, those uh, data absolutely right. And I think that's something we absolutely need to know more about is just what impact we're having. And it is completely different to doing something in the physical world like you're driving your car, but we need to make it more real to people. Um, I mean, in that work by the Royal Society, we talked about, for example, the value of being able to create um, connected digital twins that better assess the uh, you know, environmental impact of different systems from you know, manufacturing processes to whole international supply chains and using sensors and data to be able to understand how to optimize them and then to quantify the impact of that optimization. So I think there really is a benefit of using data in that way. But of course, as mentioned, using data does have an environmental energy cost as well. And that kind of takes me to one of the points in which I think that engineers have a particular role here, which is it's a systems question. And it's about, it matters sometimes the systems optimization. So if we know that using data and digital technology can create interventions in say a supply chain that has a significant enough uh, impact on energy use and carbon emissions that it you know, outweighs the use of that digital technology, then we know we're doing something of net benefit. So that really takes an interconnected systems approach. So I think that's one of the key ways in which uh, engineering plays a role in thinking about how we make sure that the overall impact of data and its whole life cycle is considered from the, the outset of creating a digital system and how we use that digital system. And taking that kind of um, systems approach can help support what might be thought of as a kind of ethics by design or a privacy by design approach to creating digital systems. And this is something that, you know, regulation pushes towards is creating systems so that they aren't, you know, hoarding data, collecting excessive data, leaking data and so on. So I think there's a really important point about, you know, privacy and ethics by design. And that leads me to some considerations about the role of privacy enhancing technologies, which again, work I did at the Royal Society, also involving uh, fellows at the Royal Academy of Engineering, highlighted some really interesting new technologies that can help better manage data. And these are emerging technologies and a diverse set of technologies, but privacy enhancing technologies in different ways enable um, the use of data, the ability to get uh, you know, insight value from data whilst sort of minimizing the potential risk in terms of privacy or managing data in certain ways. So for example, one form of uh, privacy enhancing technology might be something such as multi-party computation or federated machine learning. Put simply, this is the sort of system by which instead of taking lots of data sets and bringing them together to analyze them, you can do data analysis across different data sets that are held in different places. And that can help create, avoid sort of privacy risk of linking diverse data or security risk of transferring data. But you know, it doesn't involve moving data around. So as a result, you know, it gives us a better ability to manage that data and indeed have control over its whole life cycle, such as making sure it's deleted when it's no longer um, of value and when it's important to do that. So rather than creating the duplicate data sets or extra large data sets, you can manage data where it is. There's also approaches that enable sort of use of data where it sits on devices in the Internet of Things instead of drawing data out of the devices and centralizing it. Again, pushing things to the edge of the system. And whilst you know, it's not obvious that that helps with the question of end of data life, it does potentially help you create a system that has more management and more control in it. And then finally, I wanted to mention a sort of personal data stores or something within that spectrum of technologies which have the potential to enable people to have greater control over data and enable the better kind of um, permitting and, and sort of enabling access to data again so that data isn't necessarily always kind of collected and brought together. So I think there's some interesting technologies, primarily focused on privacy and definitely, you know, nascent technologies, but well designed and well implemented, they could potentially have a role in enabling a better whole life cycle approach to data. Thank you, Natasha. Some really great and specific examples there. Um, and I can see the questions coming in from the audience, which is great. Keep them coming. Um, before we get to those, did, was there anything else you wanted to add about the role of engineers in addressing these issues and how, how well equipped we are today as a profession to respond effectively? I think Natasha covered <laughs> uh, very well. Um, the thing that I just wanted to mention is, well, this is definitely a challenge that requires a lot of parties to work together. Of course, engineers are going to be really one of the key players. 
uh, because we are one of those people who are actually using and designing the system that use that sort of uh, infrastructure, capture data and uh, deliver the services that we want. For example, all the creative way of designing the data centers or uh, sensors that we design and optimize the efficiency are actually the work of uh, engineers. One of the things that perhaps um, we need to work a little more on that is um, what Natasha mentioned, like ethics from the beginning designed by um, the, the whole concept in, in the middle of the um, um, engineering. We, we don't think of environmental impact as a functioning element of a system, perhaps, because, um, you know, this is really a new um, area of um, engineering. And I think... Um, you know, we are engineer and uh, we, we should be able to set our sensor at the frequency of sensing. That is the most appropriate for both, of course, the accuracy and efficiency of the, the whole system that we want, but also as much as it is environmentally um, not very damaging, not just because we can, we should sense this amount of data. You know, data has revolutionized engineering and that's amazing we we can do a lot of things that we we were not able thanks to data but there is a limit i think recognizing that balance optimizing that um um with the um the level of you know they there is a compromise between accuracy and um environmentally damage um that we can make and i think engineers are really good in terms of optimization so i think um, that definitely um is going to be a big part of um all the design that we make. Thank you so much, Anna and Natasha, actually. I'm going to start on the audience questions. Um, and I'm going to start with you, Anna. There are a couple that I'm going to link together, which are really more about, you know, your your sort of um, your statistics around the um, the cost, if you like, <laughs> the, the, the energy cost in particular, um, that is associated with, with, with different um, applications of data. So Dawn Bonfield has asked whether you happen to know um, Okay, I'll have to be able to give examples of the cost of BIM building information modelling. And then Susan Govinek has asked a slightly broader question uh, about whether there is data on the relative proportions of digital data generated by domestic and industrial users so that we can help to identify where those big wins are and where actually the amount of effort in in um, reducing uh, you know, the impact is, is not really worth it when you look at the whole system. Um, Anna, comments on those? Um, well, that's a very interesting question, actually. Um, overall, that that's a positive. I must say that you know we, we talk about the uh, the the challenge of environmental emission um, in a way that as if it, data is really a, a a bad thing is not for example with bim we are actually saving a lot of energy because you know these lamps behind me are not supposed to be um on because of bim we can actually monitor that and you know energy efficiency is going to be made available and possible because of data collection so it's really hard to calculate how much overally we are actually saving um, and, and how much we are actually paying. Um, for BIM specifically, it really depends on, you know, the level of detail that you actually have got. For example, if uh, you set the sensors at the higher frequency, um, just because you can, not because you need data at that level to monitor the, um, the building. Well, of course, that, that's going to be relatively redundant information that you secure or how long you keep the data available even after the building completely shut down and collapse. You know, that, that's another matter. So I don't think there is a specific number about BIM, but in terms of, for example, um, domestic use and industrial uh, use of data, there are good statistics. Of course, I must say that over the last two years, because we work from home and that has been really blur the whole um, boundary between work, place, um, home and other um, sort of um, sector, it, it made it really difficult. But just just to give uh, another interesting, you know, stats related to that, just work that we have done remotely um, as a part of the pandemic mitigation plan has got the uh, carbon dioxide emission equivalent of um, 3.4 billion um, tons, which is quite a lot. And that's, um, you know, if, if we want to look into the kind of equivalent of that in terms of how much the um, greenhouse gases would be the emission, that would be um, the forest at the size of twice of Portugal. So um, it's going 
going to be big, but that's just because of remote working. So it is a, a little difficult to give a number exactly um, on, on top of um, you know the, the the kind of sector that we have. So there are good statistics in terms of you know one minute at uh, home, you know, in terms of the, for example, uh, going on social media, watching Netflix and, um, you know, using or a smart um, card, you know, these sorts of activities that are really domestic, how much they would cost. Um, but I think it's really difficult to actually look at it holistically. And I think that, that means we need to have a better, um, you know, sort of um, working together group of people to bring everything in, into it, the account. So as Natasha said, systems approach, looking holistic approach um, for this it is kind of a key. Thank you, Anna, for sharing some of those stats, but also just reminding us that it's very easy to get distracted by an isolated number. And we do need to understand that number in context. Um, Natasha, by all means, comment on that too. But I'd like to also feed you one or two of the other questions that are coming in. Uh, so Philippa Cox has asked, do you think that sharing with the public more about how and where data is being stored would help? Because it's not nearly so obvious and so visible as a traditional power station. Um, so you might want to comment on that. And also, if people want to understand more about the policy um, documents and strategies that are available regarding data and sustainability, is there a place that you would advise them to look? Um, I'll ask you first, Natasha. Yeah, great questions. I think it's it's a really interesting point about kind of public awareness of how and where data is stored. And actually, I think there are some good examples, as Anna said, about um, companies being inventive and looking for good solutions that enable renewable technology or, or reducing energy needs. So I think you know, it would be quite interesting to know what the possibilities are and for people to understand you know, uh, what is being done and can be done to reduce the environment, environmental impact of the data they use. But I think the main point really is I just really like some of those examples of Anna's just the small differences you can make by using digital systems to look at this. Often it feels cost free when you're doing it. Um, but I think there are, are lots of different ways in which people can make, you know, try to make real to themselves the, the cost of using digital devices. You know, it might well be that you know, there's a choice you can make when you're watching your programs on streaming at home where you, you watch them at a low resolution. You can keep your devices for longer. That, a lot of embedded carbon as well so it's not just a question of where the data centers are um, and I encourage you know, companies working in that space to keep uh, pushing towards using renewable energy and ways of reducing energy use but it's also kind of the whole system including you know what you do with your digital of devices and how long you keep them um, in terms of policy document there's a wealth of really interesting uh, work out there whether it's in independent policy advice or whether it's within the policy documents of UK government and beyond, you know, there's certainly these considerations within some of the broader work around data, such as the national data strategy. It's also some very interesting policy documents, again, about using data to create more efficient energy systems. So I don't know if we're able to add little links to the yeah. link, to LinkedIn item afterwards, but we will certainly pull some things together and make sure that there's some useful resources available after the session. Thank you, Natasha. Yes, I think that'd be great. Um, one topic we haven't talked about so far, and I'm glad this question's just popped in about, um, that I wanted to get to is, we, we focus a lot on sustainability, which is a hugely important topic. But actually, Anna, when you did your frame at start, you, you, you highlighted a whole panoply of issues that, that we didn't really yet um, have great answers to. And one of those was digital inheritance. So um, Cordelia Birch is asking about the, the issues that arise when um, someone dies, what happens to their data and what are the problems there? So could you talk to us a bit about this issue of digital inheritance, uh, Anna, and, and, and other associated issues? Yes, that's a very, very interesting question. And I think that's a very, very important one too. Um, as we discussed, our data can outlive ourselves. Um, it's not just for people, you know, even when building collapsed, the data could still remain in data centers and, you know, on servers. And this is a huge problem because the ownership is under some sort of, um, I don't know, vagueness, because it really depends what type of data. That, that's basically the, the whole issue. For example, uh, if it is personal data that doesn't have monetary value, that's go going to be very, very challenging because you cannot pass it over to another person. For example, my social uh, media account is not that easy because I cannot put it on my will and send it to someone else. 
Um, it, there are security issues associated with that. If I put my username and password on a public document, that is uh, basically the, the will, um, it's not going to be very secure. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, if different companies have got their own different strategy, we've got memorial accounts, we've got some um, people who can be nominated to take over your data. Uh, for example, Twitter requires you to put a death certificate and then claim that the owner, the account holder is dead. And so they can actually deactivate the account. Facebook or um, similar platform that Meta takes care of, they can set up memorial accounts. Some of the other act, um, social media platform, they allow someone else to be nominated to represent. These are not very consistent. These are very, very challenging. Um, and just imagine that one family needs to take care of all these activities just to make sure that their loved one account is not going to be hacked by a hacker and being misused for several um you know reason and that will have emotional um, um problem for the family who just lost someone um well of course some of these type of data for example cryptocurrency bitcoin they have some monetary value although you need to still go to court and make that case but you can pass them um to someone um but but generally in most of the countries uh digital inheritance is not a regulation that is recognized by the government governments and, and um, jurisdiction um, process. So that's going to be a massive issue because these accounts are not going to be as secure as before, because as we mentioned, GDPR and Data Protection Act only are applicable to a person from the day that they're born until the day that they die. So after um, the time that I die, if my account is being hacked, my family cannot easily go to police and say, well, this account has been hacked. They, they need to go through a very tedious process to uh, get it sorted out. So this is a problem because our data can outlive ourselves. And um, in that sense, um, the inheritance is one aspect, but also security and safety of the account are going to be. And this is going to be massive um, issue in the future, because as we know, um, since we move towards um, the digital age, you know, basically every minute that we talk, there are 300 more Twitter account that pops up. And, and, you know, this is going to be massive problem in future, both for the businesses, of course, they don't want to go to court every day basis, but also for, for the users. So this is basically the, um, the main challenge of not having a end of life design at the beginning. For example, when we open up an account, we give consent in terms of what our data should look like, um, who can have access to what part of our data. We don't give a consent about what will happen when um, the account holder actually dies. And perhaps it should be designed from the beginning when we open up those apps and services um, set up. Such a such an interesting and important topic. And as you say, it's something people have to deal with at one of the single most distressing and emotionally demanding times of, of any of our lives. And, and so are there any examples of good practice that we can learn from when we try and start thinking about what good legislation would look like here, Anna? Oh, that's a very good question. I think, as we said, data is very unique. Because of that, there aren't too many examples. But uh, one of the best examples that I found is very, very interesting, and it's possible to replica, is, for example, we have similar data uh, protection and consent for our medical data in our NHS, in National Health Service in the UK. Um, for example, our NHS data will be deleted of 10 years after our death. This is normal practice. Of course, there are exceptions and, and they remain confidential. For example, if the family goes to the GP to ask access, they cannot easily get access simply because it is already designed. They, they got the consent from the patient and um, it will be deleted. And that 10 years is actually because it is beneficial for the whole society because they do um, analysis and, you know, they, they need to protect that. This is a very good example because NHS is aware of the death of a patient because that's a part of the whole process. Um, perhaps we can actually have that sort of example for our social media account. It needs to be consistent. And I think for NHS that, that has been very, very successful. And you know it, we trust the highest standard and that has been really well implemented. So perhaps for digital data, similar practices could be implemented too. 
Brilliant, Anna, that's so helpful. Um, please do keep those questions coming. Natasha, I'm going to turn to you because actually this resonates with something I've heard you talk about before, which is a need to build alignment between the law and technology and engineering and to do so in a way that doesn't hold back the useful application and, and innovation within technology, but does ensure safety and privacy and ethical treatment. Do you think we've got the right skills and the right roles in place to facilitate this process and to do so at the pace at which technology change is happening and the pace at which we're accumulating data? Yeah, I think that I think there's a, a lot of work going on uh, to try and build that capacity to have meaningful conversations about the impact of technology on society and what that therefore means for policy and law. But, you know, it's a challenging thing to do. And I, I think this kind of example talking about digital inheritance can highlight what needs to be done to be able to really create meaningful connections to, between those different parties. So, uh, this question around, you know, data in, uh, after we've died and, and additional inheritance reminds me of conversations that stem from the work we did with the Royal Society of the British Academy and with Tech UK looking at data ownership. You know, we talk about, you know, rights about data and if, if data is mine, I should be able to sort of set out what my rights are around data. But actually owning data is a, con is a, con a complex idea. We can't own data in the same way that we own physical property, it has very different characteristics, which Anna set out really well at the beginning. You know, data that is about me can be data about other people too. So if I set my wishes about data about myself, say it's health data, it also might be data that is relevant to people I'm related to. You know, if I set wishes about uh, data on social media that has pictures of other people in it, you know, that is data about other people. So I think there's some really complicated questions here that we need to address about how we define and exercise rights around data. And what comes up in this kind of example, I think, is a like, disconnect between the technical nature of data, the legal concept of ownership, and the everyday expectation that you should be able to make decisions about something that you consider to, in some sense to be yours, i.e. I consider that the images I put on Facebook to be my, my data and my images on Facebook. So I think there's a really kind of deep need for well-convened conversations that can help connect different viewpoints, which is same vocabulary in different ways or different vocabulary for the same thing. So I think that there's some really uh, you know, deep needs. And I feel that the you know, organizations I mentioned earlier, such as the Center for Data Ethics and Innovation, Ada Lovelace Institute, are doing really good work to um, help convene these conversations, which are fundamental questions about the nature of data and digital systems and indeed AI systems and what it means to regulate them. Uh, I think there's more need to bring in that kind of closer conversation between technologists, regulators, and broader society. One area that comes up a lot in the work I, talk, I get involved in is around the importance of standards and the Royal Academy of Engineering just, for example, had a, a recent workshop on the role of regulation and standards in autonomous systems, which are obviously data intensive systems. And I think that what we need to be doing is ensuring that those technical standards bring in the best technical expertise, but also bring in viewpoints from policy, from social sciences and from civil society, so that we can work from those deep questions about the kind of concepts they're working with here, right through to meaningful technical standards that are really tractable and usable in technical settings, but also address some of the concerns that come up through society. Thank you, Natasha. And Anna, would you like to add to this? Because actually, this is very much where you're positioned, isn't it? You're, you're working with policymakers, you're, you're, on, you're doing the research to, to actually expose the data that people are asking questions about. You're working with companies. What would you like to see happen to, to bring those worlds closer together so that we can really um, be as effective as possible at this, this critical interface between engineering technology, policy and society? Yeah, I, I think um, there are, again, multi players in the system, as Natasha covered, it should be citizen asking that question, I should be asking the question where my data is going to stop when I'm no longer um, in the position to be able to have a say in who can have access to my data. Um, this should be uh, something that is stem from the both education, but also awareness that we will get uh, through the public debates that, for example, Natasha mentioned, um, there are institutes um, and initiatives that talking about this sort of activities like Ada Lovelace, uh, the Alan Shoring Institute. These are the, um, the places that actually promote the conversation about that. But of course, the policymakers should adjust 
the regulation that are related to something as big and valuable as data. You know, we talk about something that that if we put numbers on that, it would be bigger than some of the countries, um, you know, the whole GDP that we have. Some of these big companies like Google and um, Uber and, you know, some of them are more valuable than some of the countries in terms of the GDP that they have uh, annually. And, and that that's um, perhaps requires some new regulation that we need. But also in terms of the design of the system, if it is within our education, system you know every single line of code that i write will have the thinking behind it is it ethical it, do i actually need that much of data to be a source do i need this level of um detail of data that i have and i think um again going back to the medical example you know any medical student went from day one they learn about ethics i think computer scientists perhaps uh, should also start learning about, you know, we may need to have like the um, the oath we, um, we, we have um, take um, in terms of ethics of um, the uh, the application that we develop. Um, and, um, and of course, the recognition of who is going to own it after the user is no longer there should be basically at the first page when we, you, you log in, you give the consent should be a statement about we are going to delete this. I don't know, um, at, at some point when we realise that you don't have access to this physically. I know you'll be glad to hear that the Academy, along with the Engineering Council, is, is leading some profession-wide work on ethics. And uh, so this is this is very topical. Um, I just want to quickly pick up another question from the chat, Anna, which is, oh, Anna and or Natasha, you know, the UK situation. It, do, you think, do you think we're well-placed in the global context? Is this a shared challenge or are some countries leading the way on this? I'll ask Anna first. I think we, we are leading on that. Um, first of all, we should remember that these are some of the challenges that are actually brought by the researcher here in the UK. And um, of course, there are big challenges somewhere else because they don't have the same mechanism that we have. But we, we talked about some of the good practices, for example, that we have about data that we have, personal data that we have in NHS, um, the standard of ethics and data ownership that we have. Um, I, I think we are in a very good position to lead on that. Well, of course, it requires a very good uh, collaboration with all the big companies and other countries because data doesn't have really geography boundaries. You know, it, 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 it basically uh, works um, like air. You know, it doesn't really belong to every single person. Um, but I think it, the UK have got very good mechanism to cope with that. For example, we talked about digital inheritance, but some of the thing that we do is going back to some of the regulation that we have and try to project how data would fit into that, for example, um, if data has got monetary value, we can still uh, look at it as a kind of a set that has got monetary value. Um, if it is social, but we someone claimed that has got some income because you are an influencer on Instagram and we get some money. So the account is not just social capital, it's not just social value or emotional value. They can go to court and protect that. It's not as straightforward as it should be, but we have the mechanism to, to project back what exists. And so perhaps implementing new regulation would be a little easier than some of the other countries. That's that's really helpful. Thank you. Quite encouraging. And, and Natasha, I don't know if you've got any comments on that or indeed the, the question that's just come in um, from Shane McHugh about good practice um, that we can we can draw in in terms of how to communicate, particularly to users, um, the carbon footprint associated with stored data and, and to, to engage citizens in the in the the process of trying to to be as efficient to optimize as Anna said earlier um the impact of that thank you yeah I mean I can't really kind of uh, just call to mind right now particular examples of good practice but I do you know we do start to see uh you know in the system she these little nudges and little nudges saying that a tab in our browser is idle and that reduces energy by such and such a percentage and I think just things like this little nudges all the time uh, can help us navigate the digital system and can help us think about the, the carbon footprint of what we do and I think Little labels and nudges like that have a have certain degree of value. Um, in work I've been involved with in the past, we've talked about the value of kite marks, the, the value of things like the padlock that tells you your browser is secure. You start, they become parts of your sort of trust system when you use digital products. products. So I think it would be great to see more of those sorts of things. Um, I was interested in that sort of question that you, you posed to Anna 
their high art and in terms of, of the UK and the global question. I think that the UK is doing some excellent work, but it, it is a global issue. And I think we're seeing some very interesting organizations coming up globally to help tackle questions around use of data. And I think there's a real interesting set of questions that the global research community can work on too. And one thing I often think about when, um, when we work on these sorts of questions is, you know, we've, we've got this kind of moment where Technologies such as AI technologies took off because we have this wealth of data, we have big data, we have power to compute it. But your big data is messy and it's not always well managed and, you know, it can become from different sources. It has lots of different pathways behind it. And there's a value, I think, in moving towards sort of standardization of data, having cleaner data. But as Anna was saying, think about what data do you need to do this research? I'm interest, interested, for example, what's the opportunity for small data AI, AI that learns from less data, from well-curated data sets? What's the value in creating synthetic data that's really representative, but is replicable and usable and doesn't involve harvesting lots of data? So I think there's lots of interesting things going on in the UK from a policy point of view and a research point of view. But I think some fantastic research challenges about how thinking how we can design systems that they use data in a smarter, more limited, more careful way. Natasha, that, that is brilliant what you sort of rounded up without me even asking you to do so. Um, and I'm going to give you the last word to, to kind of leave, leave the audience with your final thoughts of what you would really like to see happen in this area. I want, well, that, that's interesting to, to end. I think we all need to look into our digital lifestyle a bit more critically. Um, think about everything that you do digitally and try to think twice really it, data is like plastic we sometimes need that but we need to be careful and too much of anything can really make us sick so data is exactly like that it has made our life easier and it is very useful thing to have but we need to be very careful how much we are actually overly uh, excessively using a data um also Data is unique in many ways, so we need to rethink basically everything that is designed for anything physical to, to see, is it a adaptable? Is it something that I need to adjust for digital data? And I think that requires a good collaboration between policymakers based on industry, developers, and the users all together to work and make the data as green, as clean as possible. Anna and Natasha, thank you so much for a really interesting and stimulating discussion. I have learned so much. <laughs> um, you know, we've talked about what's special about data. It's a very unusual engineered asset because of its immortality, its invisibility, but also its ubiquity. But we've also at the same time talked about the fact that some of the principles of good engineering design apply just as much to data as they do to any other engineered product service piece of infrastructure. Um, we want to see that systems approach to understanding impact and benefit. We need to have that user-centric approach to design. We need to embed ethics and sustainability thinking into the way that we design and to do that from the outset. And we need to be intentional about designing for end of life from the start, which is very much the intention behind the safer end of engineered life mission. We've talked about digital diets and digital carbon footprints and digital death, all sorts of things that I hadn't, I must confess, until today spent enough time reflecting on. And I think that all of us will go away as better informed citizens, as well as hopefully participants in this, this movement for progress. So you've been um, fantastically insightful and really clear. Thank you both again for your excellent contributions, but thank you also to our audience for some very insightful questions. Um, this is a participatory event and it doesn't work without your input, so thank you so much. We hope that you found this a helpful discussion for building collective understanding of why end of life matters for data and how the engineering community and, and those we work with can contribute to tackling some of the safety, sustainability, ethical challenges um, that are associated with it, as well as highlighting some of the things that we can each do in our daily lives. If this conversation has sparked your interest in what the Academy does or what Engineering X is doing on this issue, please do go and have a look at our web, pa web pages on Safer End of Engineered Life. And I think probably someone at this moment will drop a link into the chat. Um, and if you've got further comments, reflections after today's event, please do respond to the survey. There definitely is a link going into the chat about that. And we'll also email those of you who've joined us today because your feedback really helps us to shape and improve future events. So thank you for taking the time in advance to share your thoughts. Please do stay tuned for further critical conversations on our LinkedIn page. But for now, thank you all so much for joining us. 
Um, I hope you have a great evening and thank you again to our fantastic speakers, Anna Basiri and Natasha McCarthy. Thank you so much. Thank you.